Hello beautiful people. Welcome to this brand new season of Real Talk with Nana. Now this season, we are excited to bring you exceptional, captivating content as we explore the stories of black successful entrepreneurs right here in Britain. No doubt you'll be intrigued by their stories, who they are and how they got here. In this episode, we sit down with one of UK's renowned lifestyle physicians. His story will reveal his journey through foster care, getting kicked out of medical school, and how he fought his way back to be who he is today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Real Talk with Dr. Chidi. All right, hello, Dr. Chidi. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for um, allowing us into your home. Um, we've really enjoyed being here, and so we just want to speak to you about your success, your life story, how, how you've been able to make it to the top. Now, without, you know, I know, I know, I know you were a lifestyle um, physician. Now, that is something people are going to ask. What's a lifestyle physician? Can you please tell us what a lifestyle physician is? Um, what are you were? Absolutely. And you're welcome. Thank yeah. you. Good to have you. Um, I guess sometimes when you say, oh, I'm a lifestyle doctor, people think, well, are you an interior designer or something mm -hmm. like that? Lifestyle? Mm -hmm. But really, it is being a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a fully trained doctor. But many of the diseases that we have, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, arthritis, they are a, a function of our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That's what's got us there. For example, we know that if you smoke, you're likely to get lung cancer. If you eat certain types of food, you'll get obese and diabetic. OK, so if that's the cause, if lifestyle is the cause, then obviously lifestyle must be the cure. Mm. What we're taught as doctors is to say, well, forget about the lifestyle, let's just give you medication that will keep you on for the rest of your life, and then we'll stop you from dying, but we won't cure you. Lifestyle medicine says, right, if it's a lifestyle that's caused it, let's look at the lifestyle that will reverse it, mm. and if we can reverse it, we can get you free of the disease and free of the medication. So, so are you saying that you can actually reverse diabetes, heart attack, and no, you can actually reverse it? Absolutely, so oh. things like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, they are completely reversible. Mm. That's not me saying it, there are thousands of studies that show that. Mm -hmm. Now we don't do that mm -hmm. most of the time in medicine, but the evidence is there. Yeah. And I can tell you that I've done hundreds if not thousands of people. I've reversed oh. thousands of people on all of those diseases. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to it, but you know, I want, I want us to start your journey. You yes, know, yes. Dr. Chidi, the little boy. Where were you born, by the way? I was born in Chelsea, London. Chelsea, London. Okay. I'm, I'm not a Chelsea supporter, <laughs> just which, in case. Which team, which team do you support? Well, you know, Arsenal. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. I, I don't support any of those teams anymore, okay? <laughs> you know, my local team is Crystal Palace. Oh, but, that's good. Know. Stay there. Yeah. Let's stay there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, as a young boy growing up in Chelsea, um, at what point did you decide that you are going to become a medical doctor? Well, first of all, I wish I grew up in Chelsea. I, mm. I mean, I was born in Chelsea, in a hospital in Chelsea, but I, I was raised out in Tooting. But actually, as a small boy, mm. in fact, as six months old, I was, I was in a foster home for six mm. years. Whoa. Yes, I was in a foster home in Brighton, and I was raised by a lovely white family, um, mm. very poor white family. And uh, for six years, they looked after me. Um, they were nice people, mm. but they just weren't great at being parents. And mm. so I, I spent a lot of my time on my own and, uh, you know, running about on the streets, doing whatever I wanted to do. Eventually, I came back to London with my real parents. Mm. You know, this is no news to anybody who's of African descent. You know, yeah. your parents are traveling, working. You go into some kind of foster care. And so when I came back to my family, I was in South London, Tooting, and that's kind of where my journey started, mm. primary school. I had this idea um, when I was about 10 years old, okay, I think I want to be a doctor. W where did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it came from, my parents had all these books. Uh, Dr. Kellogg was, was one character in these books, and I said, well, this, this guy's quite interesting. I wouldn't mind doing a business like Dr. Keller, because he was more than a doctor, he was an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. And he healed people from all over the world. Mm, he done the cereal stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so Dr. Keller, he started the cereal. Um, 
And then I said to myself, okay, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I guess I have to be a doctor first. Mm -hmm. That's where the idea mm -hmm. came from. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't go to the best schools in the world. I went mm -hmm. to some of the worst schools in London, actually. Oh. My, my old school, Spencer Park, was the worst in London. Oh. Probably one of the most violent, oh. uh, the least academic, right? I did mean, you, did, so, you, did you get into any trouble? No, I didn't. No, oh, I didn't. Okay. Because, because I had that goal in my head from very early on. So even though you're surrounded by all of this chaos, mm -hmm. I just remember, hey, I can't step out of line because I need to get into medical school. So my, I had to be focused. So now I need to, like, you are young, yeah. you, have, you have this focus. Yes. Now can I ask you, what was the inspiration driving you? Because you are, you are still young, so what's that inspiration? What, what have you seen? What did you see? You know, what's, what's keeping you mm. straight and narrow? What, what was that? Do, do you remember? There, there, were, there were a few things. There were some quite um, positive and some not so positive. So I'll start with the not so positive. I was surrounded by, I've been surrounded much of my life by a lot of poverty. Mm. I was raised in it. Mm. This white family I lived with never had any money. You know, the, on a Thursday afternoon, they'd go down to the local butchers and get whatever the people mm. were throwing out. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, I was raised with all of that poverty and I said, I don't want a life like that. So how am I going to get myself out of it? Medicine seemed like a good way. That's, that's one side. Mm -hmm. The other side was I had this deep desire mm -hmm. inside of me to say, hey, I would like to really be of service. I would really love to be able to heal people if that's possible. That, and so that thing, so in order to do it, I had to get into medical school. And in order to get into medical school, I had to keep on the straight and narrow. And it doesn't matter what my environment was, I was just going to stay focused on Would you that. say you were disciplined? Very disciplined. Very good. Very disciplined. Yeah. So now you finish primary school, you yeah. go to secondary school, yeah. and then you go to uni. What secondary school did you go to? I went to a school called Spencer Park. As I say, it was one of the worst schools in London. We used to have this thing called the Inner London Education Authority. Some awful schools. So my school was just incredibly violent. It was in Wandsworth. Um, Wandsworth is a very posh part of London, but you've got this school, Spencer Park, and Wandsworth is very white, by the way, but Spencer Park was about 80% black boys, right, and black boys who were kicked out of every other school. Now, why I ended up in that school, I, I, I still don't know to this day, but despite its violence and despite its poor teaching, I kind of had a good time there. Because I was good at sport and I captained all these sports teams and I was treated with a lot of respect at that, at that place. And even some of the guys who were very, who were just not going anywhere, many of them headed straight into prison after school. Even them, I could see in them, they would look at me and say, yeah, you're doing something different. I remember that. You want to go to medical school? A black boy? What, what, what's all that about? But they still kind of believed in me. So, um, yeah, I managed to get out of that school, got my grades, got myself into medical school. I mean, I, I can say the day that I gained entrance into medical school, it was, it was a great medical school in central London. I thought, this is it, my life has changed. I've done it. So, so, so this is exciting work. for you. Yes. You worked your way, yes. hard work, discipline, get yeah. yourself into medical school. Yeah. And then you got kicked out. Tell me the story. What happened? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I mean, that was decades ago. Mm -hmm. I was good. Mm -hmm. I was good in medical school. I was pretty bright and I was quite diligent. But let me just be honest. Out of, we had 110 medical students, there were two black people, mm -hmm. right? Two black people. Hardly any Asians at the time either. Now, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I know when I went into those exams, I passed those exams. But they told me, no, you failed, get out. That was, that was devastation, right? That was devastation. That was my whole life. I've worked my whole life to get there. I've, I've made it, and you're out. And so I had to think to myself, what are you going to do, Chidi? What are you going to do? And uh, I thought, mm, do I want to be a doctor still? Mm -hmm. Do I give up? I said, no, no, that desire is still there. I have to do it. But there was no way you can do medicine in Britain once you've been kicked out. Wow. So what do you do? The only thing you can do, you look abroad and you say, well, where, where else can I do it? I looked at France. I, was, I loved French, so I thought, maybe I'll go to France. Mm. But it was very expensive. Germany was free, but I didn't speak German. 
So I said, what am I, am I actually going to go to Germany, learn German and then try and get into medical school? That's exactly what I did. I said, okay, I'm going out to Germany. I was 19 years old, packed myself off to Germany, uh, went to a Goethe Institute to learn German. And then after six months of learning German, mm -hmm. I did the entrance exam in German for medical school. Okay. And uh, I passed that exam. Wow. But then something happened. As I passed the exam, the laws changed back in Great Britain that you could reapply. Mm. So I came back, I did a degree first, and then I got back into medicine, and I did it at University College and Cambridge. But when you were in Germany, yes, you, uh, you didn't have family? No, no, no. It was just you. Just How old me. were you then? 19. And you were still disciplined? Oh yeah. What, what was your motivation there? What was your inspiration at that point? What, 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 what kept you going? Because, in, in it, I mean, to be, to be honest with you, most people would have given up when you were kicked out. Yeah. You went the step further to look for a school outside England, yeah. fix yourself in Germany, mm -hmm. determined to learn German, mm -hmm. done it, passed it. Yeah. There must be something motivating you. I know you want to be a, a doctor. That was the first motivation. Mm -hmm. But what was the, I mean, because I can't, I can't describe the feeling. I don't know, were you ever down? Were you ever, did you ever feel sad, lonely? Oh. But, uh, you know, and what, what kept you going? Well, those are good questions and those are relevant questions because those were some of the lowest parts of my life. So I had lost, for me, at 19, I'd lost everything. Mm. It, it, once I'd been kicked out, so what, what, what are you now, Chidi? You're just a guy with some A-levels. It was a big deal for me, having to go to Germany. I mean, yes, I wanted to be a doctor, but you're on your own, man. You can't even speak to somebody on the street because they're all German, mm. right? So you are isolated, low, but you're asking me what kept you going. Mm -hmm. The thing that kept me going, there's a few things. Yeah. You know, I had a, a mother who really did believe in me. Mm -hmm. you know, she just, no matter what, you know, she, it was difficult for her to see what happened to me, but she still believed in me. And if you're asking me, well, what really, in the dark times, what really yeah. kept you going? I mean, I have to say, I'm a Christian, right? I'm brought up in the church. Mm -hmm. The one thing that really kept me going was that character in the Bible, Joseph. Everybody kind of knows him, Joseph, yeah. and the amazing technical Egypt, dream coat. Yeah. But what happened to him, all the unfair things that happened to him, and where he ended up, mm -hmm. it just resonated with me. I just said, look, this Bible's not just about those people, it's about me as well. Mm -hmm. It's for me, this is my life. So I thought, yeah, I'm not going to give up. And that, and that wonderful text in the Bible which says, even when he was in the darkest part of the dungeon, the Lord was with Joseph, mm. right? The Lord is with me, me out there in Germany. I mean, some of the days were so wretched that, listen, as a black man, you walk through a, mm -hmm. a small German village. Mm. I mean, people put their shopping down and look at you. They say, they've, never, they've never seen this before. I remember walking around a corner one day and a little dog saw me looked at me and just ran off. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that was life at the time. So it wasn't great, it wasn't, it wasn't fantastic, but I knew that I'm here for a purpose and I knew I had to complete this course. So now you, let's go, so now you finish um, your course, you're about to start your, your, your medicine in Germany and then the laws change in England. Yes. And then you decide, you know what, I'm going back home. Yes. And then yes. What, what happened is where did you, I mean, you know, which, which school, where, where did you end up in? Well, so I came back, um, one college, King's College said, well, we, yeah, we'll take you. Yeah. Um, but why don't you start this course first, this degree first in physiology and pharmacology. I started it. They hadn't worked it all out. So I actually had to finish the whole degree before I could then reapply for medicine. So I did the degree in physiology and pharmacology. And then I reapplied and I got into University College London. And, and then I ended up in Cambridge as well. Um, but for me, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, you know, I've wasted a few years out there. What am I going to do? So I went back to what I thought of in the beginning. I said, well, Dr. Kellogg, you know, he owns some institutions, some health institutions. What can I do? So when I was in the first year of medical school, I said, I'm going to plan to get a restaurant. Well, I'm, I'm going to make a healthy plant-based restaurant. This was back in the 90s, right? 
and that's where that's where I started. That's so I started where, planning that's where, it. That's where entrepreneur, you know, that's, that's it. where it kicked in. That's it. That's so it. So this is at the age of um, roughly 20, 20, early twenties. Early and 20s. then you decided to set up your first, you know, plant based restaurant. Yeah. And this was a time when veganism wasn't so popular. No, right? not so popular. Yeah. So how how did the restaurant do? And it, this was Central London. I'm Central told. London, Soho, Soho, Soho in Central yeah. London. Wow. So when I qualified as a doctor, then the year after that we opened the restaurant. Mm. And I'll tell you, it was hard work because, I mean, I'd spent all those years planning, making it look beautiful, the food, everything. And it was hard work still. And we got into all the media, everybody knew about us. But very quickly, people just started to come in. You know, there were some wonderful celebrities, Oasis and Paul McCartney and Madonna. They would come in, absolutely. But the general population, they started coming in. And it it became very successful. And we, mm. we expanded into not just, because it started off as a fast food place, went into a la carte restaurant as well. And what I noticed, because I, at the time I was a surgeon, mm -hmm. right? I was up well, in so Cambridge. I was going to say, how are you juggling? Yeah, that's being, right. Being a surgeon and being a restaurant um, or, or owner operator, that's how right. did you do that? Well, it was good. I mean, I had a fantastic chef who was totally reliable and had some very good managers. So at the end of my day, I would just come and get an assessment of what was going on. Obviously, take my pat lunch for that's the next it. day, and that's <laughs> it. But um, what, the thing that struck me the most was that people were leaving messages for me, customers. Mm -hmm. And many of them were saying, look, um, since I've been coming to you three times a week, twice a week, I've lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. I don't need as much medication for my diabetes. So there I was up in Cambridge doing all these operations, by bypasses and whatever, but I was realizing, actually, I'm doing more good in the restaurant. And it, it spurred me. It reminded me of why I really went into medicine. I didn't go in to be a surgeon. I went to help heal people. And that led me on to the next part of my journey. So this is the point where you decided to go into lifestyle. So the restaurant kind of um, spurred you on to go into lifestyle. So at this point, you finished your medicine yeah. um, um, if you are practicing, you're a GP, you're, 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 you as you said, you're doing a surgeon, time. and yeah. then you decide to go to. So tell us, what do you have to study to become a lifestyle? Yeah, so there, um, there was no such thing as lifestyle medicine at the time. And, and I remember my colleagues, because these guys are at Cambridge, they're at the best place to do surgery in, in the country. And they're saying, Chitty, why would you leave this to go and do what? I don't even know what you're going to do. <laughs> So I said, yeah, but I just have to do it. So I said, well, what am I going to do? The best thing to do is to retrain and be a GP. Mm -hmm. so, so you know all the broad spectrum of illnesses and you know how to help people out. Then when I did that, I went out to the States and looked at some of the scientists who were doing the work behind lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. I came back and I said, all right, they can reverse heart disease. Why can't we reverse diabetes? Mm -hmm. Why can't we reverse high blood pressure? What about autoimmune diseases? And I looked at all of them. I looked at the research and I realized, yes, you can. So then I set up myself as a lifestyle physician. And in fact, there was a, some other people in Europe doing similar things. And we came together. We, we set up something called the European Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And what that did was to educate doctors throughout Europe and actually throughout the world that you know what you can do, even if you're a surgeon, if you're an anaesthetist, you can add lifestyle touches to your practice to improve your patients. But for me, it was all about curing people. You know, that's a strong word, curing people. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I remember when I first went to medical school, my dean said, Chidi, why do you want to be a doctor? And I said, well, I want to cure people. And he looked at me and said, we don't cure people, we treat people. Hmm. And that is the idea of medicine right now. It is to treat people. You have high blood pressure, stay on this medication for the rest of your life. It will prolong your life, but it will prolong your life with the disease. Mm. No, for me, I'm only interested in totally curing people, getting them off the medication and free from the disease. And for many diseases, which are lifestyle diseases, that's possible, and I do that. So now I'm going to take you to, to, to your roots as an African. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I know. I know you were born in Africa. You've stayed in here, but do you, you know, do you sometimes visit the continent? Yes. yes. So, which which African food do you like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. I can't say. I mean, jollof rice is. My... No, I was going to say. I, I knew you were going to go jollof yes, rice. Of so course. Which one, the Ghanaian one or the Nigerian one? Well, look, be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say um, the the the. 
I'm used to the Nigerian one, but I, I know the, the Ghanaian, Senegalese, Gambian yeah, one is the original. Is well, I know the original. Right? Right? Yeah, but, the original. But, but mine has a different stance on mm. it, right? So I love jollof rice, but I always say it must be whole grain rice that you're using. Yeah, yeah. And some people I'll, scratch I'll, their head and yeah, say, well, how do you do that? I was going to ask you, yeah. now, what's whole grain jollof rice? Whole grain jollof rice. It's the same thing. It just takes a little bit longer to cook. So whole grain jollof rice, is, it's got the whole of the grain, got the whole of the grain. White rice... As mm. wonderful as it tastes, especially jollof rice, it's really a lot of carbohydrate and sugar. I tell people, especially if they have diabetes, you have a mouthful of white rice. That's like eating a mouthful of sugar. Mm. Whole grain rice has the whole grain, so the carbohydrate is released slower into the mm. system. So I never have white rice, always whole grain. But jollof is my favourite. Wow. Okay, well, you just, you just changed my jollof thing, but it's okay. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to cook <laughs> that's it. That's good. <laughs> I mean, next time, I think we should be in the kitchen. Exactly, cooking, right? exactly. Right. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but I go back to Africa a lot. You go, you yeah. go there a lot, yeah. and you are, you are in touch with your, with, with, with your roots. And um, yes. how do you see the life? Uh, Interesting. I mean, I go there often. I do a lot of work with local government and federal government. I do this thing... Uh, Wherever I go, I, I set up a little mini clinic and people can come and get their blood pressure taken or whatever. Do you have a business there yet, by the way? Because I know you're an entrepreneur, you have yeah, well, no, I, so no, you I, have No, I'm, I'm more just consultancy okay. there and advisory okay. there. Um, we were trying to build, actually, the hospital of the future in Lagos. Mm -hmm. That may still happen, we never know. But when I screen people for blood pressure, it's rare that I find, especially a, a Nigerian man who doesn't have high blood pressure, mm. they're all... Life is stressful. Mm -hmm. The diet's not fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, if we went back to our original diet, which is more vegetables and fruit, and mm -hmm. we'd be fine. But we've become more westernized. So, yeah, life is stressful out there. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure are high. You see people quite young having strokes and mm -hmm. all sorts of debilitating diseases. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm very keen and conscious, especially in Africa, mm -hmm. to, to get this message across that doesn't have to be expensive, but it's totally revolutionary. You can cure people from their diseases and not spend billions of dollars on it. Mm. So that's a big message I have, especially for the continent of Africa. Good, good, good. Mm. Now, um, um, I had to bring this in because I know you said something earlier, which, you know, like when you were young, you wanted to be a doctor. Mm. And one day you said your mom said something to you. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, I was 10 years old. I made the decision. Okay, I've seen Dr. Kellogg. I want to be a doctor. Almost like a reflex, my mother said to me, yeah, you're going to have a, a practice on Harley Street. Mm -hmm. I was 10 years old. I didn't know what Harley Street was. We didn't have Google to look up Harley Street. So I had to get into a dictionary. What's Harley Street? Harley Street was where all the top famous doctors live. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where they do all their work. Yeah. And I just said, uh, okay, well, that sounds interesting. You know, long story short, I have a practice on Harley Street today, oh. you know. So it's like your mother, yeah. my mother speaking into my future. Good. And for me, that is the power. Mm. That's the power of mm. mentors. That's the power mm. of people who love you. Mm. They can actually speak into your mm. future. And I say that a lot. I do a lot of speaking for, for yes. young men and, mm -hmm. and, and, and youth and whatever. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do say to people, you must watch what you say over these young people. Mm. It is vital. It gets into their soul. It gets into their DNA. It, it actually predicts where they're going to go. If you're speaking positive things into the children, mm. honestly, mm. That, that really resonates in them. Mm. But also if you're speaking negatively. It does. So we have to really be careful about what we say. So that, that happened from my mother's mouth, and I'm grateful for it. And today you've, you've achieved it. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't um, seem like I was working towards it. it it looks to me like it just happened, but obviously it didn't just happen. It was spoken into my future. Now, you, you have accomplished a lot, you know. I know you are still very young. So you say. If, <laughs> if, if, um, if I were to ask you, if there's a young person listening to you who is doing medicine and just want to mm. do an intern or just mm. come, mm. maybe probably, um, you know, come and work with you or just get some, sort of, some practice for a month, would you be able to do that? Yes, well, I mean, over the years, I've, I've done that quite mm. a lot with, with many people. And, um, yeah, in all the phases of my career, I've done mm. that. 
and uh, and it's certainly available now. So if people are really interested, young people are interested, mm. and they want to see my work and see what, how it's done, I'm more than happy to do that. And in fact, I'm doing a lot with some people in America right now, that's trying to good. train them up as well. So yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And it actually feeds into this life colors project that mm. I'm doing because it is about mentorship and spreading the message but I guess we'll... all right so I just put it out there if you're a young person or you are a parent who would like your young person who is studying medicine to get this opportunity of a lifetime to 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 work or shadow with Dr. Chidi at his practice we would say please go on Twitter and um, Instagram is at Dr. Chidi MD and then please get in touch with him. Um, I'm sure um, they will vet you and they will get you in there. So I think this is a fine opportunity. Um, you've been you've been everywhere mm -hmm. doing some some great stuff. Yeah. You always in as an entrepreneur, you always have something coming up. You know, what's what's the next big thing a project you're working on? Do you want to share your vision? You know, the next big thing you're working on. Well, the big thing is um, is this Life Colors project that I have, which mm -hmm. is really about bringing that what I say, health, healing and hope to the world, mm -hmm. to the community. How are you doing that? Mm -hmm. So you do that by all of this information that I've acquired over the years and that has helped people to reverse disease. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But that's people coming one by one to me. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is to, to spread this out and reach thousands of people. There are thousands mm -hmm. of people who have all these diseases. Mm -hmm. Many of the people listening will have them. How do they, how do they get this? Well. Starting this Life Colours project will enable them in whichever community they live to access somebody who can take them on a mentoring programme so that they can go from illness to wellness. That's really what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's about to be launched. Um, there are books and videos and everything available for it. There's some children's books involved mm -hmm. in it as well. But it's really about reaching the world mm -hmm. with this message of health, healing and hope. I know you are one of the world, world leading and prominent lifestyle. Um, I don't know anyone, but you're a lifestyle um, medical practitioner. And then you are doing all this stuff, man. And then obviously you are, you are a black man mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the society. Mm. And we know the challenges for some of us to even get there. And I wanted to ask, um, in, term, in, times, in, um, in terms of your practice, your business, you know, everything you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. how are you able to rise through these challenges, you know, being a black man mm -hmm. in England and being able to achieve, obviously, what are they? Have you have had any, you know, I don't want to say, but yeah, put it that way, racist challenges, you know, what, what's, what's, what's been your story around that? Well, I mean, I would say the only, and I don't know this for certain, but the only place where there was an opportunity for racism in my life was when I got kicked out of medical school. Mm. But I must say, when I got back in, and this is through the 90s all the way up until now, I've never come across much mm. racism in, in front of me, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, there was lots of opportunities for me not to get all of these top jobs. There's yes. lots of highly qualified white people around me, mm -hmm. but for some reason they chose me. Mm -hmm. And they didn't choose me because I was black. Good. You know, it, it, it wasn't in those days, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a bit of tokenism now, but it wasn't like that mm -hmm. then. You had to be good. And this is what I say to people. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, you're going to find racism. Mm -hmm. You find it in Nigeria, you find it in Ghana, yes. you find it all throughout mm -hmm. Africa. Yes. And we're all the same colour, by the way, mm -hmm. right? So if you allow racism mm -hmm. or the, the fear of racism mm -hmm. to keep you in prison, mm -hmm. well, you failed. You're never going to succeed. Mm -hmm. The truth is, even when you're around people who think they are racist, I've been with people. I was in Germany with a guy who told me about his family and his life. They were racist people. Mm -hmm. But once they get to know you, Did this you? guy just follows me everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he wanted to be my best friend. Mm -hmm. He's never met a black person mm. like me. I, I'm saying this because what, what's important is excellence. It, think, about, think about a racist person mm. who has their loved one dying from a disease. Mm. If you're the black person who can cure that person, do you think they care about your colour? Mm. No, everything breaks down then. Everything breaks down. And actually, look, I'll, I'll go a bit further and I'll say, that's part of our purpose in this world. It is not just to fight racism. It's actually to defeat it. 
And you, you only defeat it like Martin Luther King. You know, mm. only, only light can get rid of darkness. Mm. Only love can get rid of hate. You can't beat hate with hate. Mm. So our focus needs to be on, okay, even the people who may hate me, I'm still here to serve them. Mm. That's, a, that's a difficult thing for people to, to get their head around. But that is the only way where you ever get peace in the world. That's the only way you ever change the world. Martin Luther King didn't change the world by fighting everybody. Mm. He did it through peace and love. And that's part of our process. So never be afraid of racism. Don't be afraid of racists. I mean, even if, even if somebody kicks you out of your job mm -hmm. and you know it's oh, because yeah. of racism, I tell you what, there is no doubt God has a better place for you. You don't need to be upset about it. Honestly, it's not even worth shedding a tear about it. Mm. I, mean, I, I, I kind of shed a tear when I got kicked out of medical school, but if I had known what God had in store for me, I would have been celebrating. Oh, I'm just going to give the last one. You know, a, if there is a young person or an elderly person, somebody watching, somebody listening to the sound of your voice, your testimony, where you've come from, you know, to where you are, and the person is being challenged now, you know, what advice, or if there's somebody trying to, you know, a young person wants to become an entrepreneur and the person is going through challenges, or maybe you just want to say something to, you know, what, what advice would you give the person based on your experience? Mm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll use a kind of a, a glib phrase. I would say that if there's no battle, there's no victory. Mm. Nobody gets to a pinnacle of anything unless you've met opposition. Um, you know, we're, we're here in Great Britain. I, I love history, by the way. I, I read history all the time. We're here in Great Britain. Great Britain, they have this song, Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the ways. We will never, ever, ever, we'll never be slaves. That's what they say. That's the next song. It's quite a big statement. But they were, they were almost slaves to a certain body of people. Those were the Vikings. In the old oh, days, man. the Vikings used to come into Britain, raid it, and take everything away. Britain couldn't do anything about it. And people used to scratch their heads. How are the Vikings so strong? Mm. How are they so tough? Well, the reason why they're so tough is because they're surrounded by this ferocious sea. You can only, you can only navigate your way over the sea if you're strong. In fact, the, the rough sea makes you strong. Mm. The difficulty that you find yourself in now is not against you. It's actually for you. Mm. And if you understand that God is actually in this process, he hasn't forgotten you. You realize that, oh, just like Joseph, the Lord is with me. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. Oh. I just want to ask you, what's your, what's your routine? What's your day like when you wake up in the morning? And you, I mean, from the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to sleep, what's your day like? Well, they're not always the same, but I, a general, the general one would be, I get up at about five o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, my routine is I would... I start my day in the gospel. I re I'm Prison. reading something from the gospel. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I have my prayer time, my time with God, the gospel. I, I often read Proverbs as well. Mm -hmm. And then I get to my desk and I start writing. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's, I'm writing several different things at the moment, obviously for my courses mm -hmm. and certain books that I'm writing. And then it would be, I go for a run. I do a 5K run. Five kilometers. Yeah, I do five oh, kilometers uh, six times a week. Ooh. And then after the five kilometers, I'm at the gym. So uh, that workout session, running at the gym, is a two hour session mm. running, gym, and walking. Mm. So it's two hours a day, that's what I do. Come back, go back to my work. I'll be doing appointments, consultations, whether they be online or, or in real reality. Um, if I had to do any speaking engagements, mm -hmm. it would be during the evening or something. I then come towards the end of the day. I listen. It's so interesting. Though. I try to pack a lot in. So mm -hmm. if I'm moving from place to place, or if I'm running or exercising, I'm listening to books on the Audible mm -hmm. app. Mm -hmm. I should get I should get royalties for that. <laughs> the Audible app. So I'm listening to all sorts of things. And then come the end of the day, I have my meal. I usually tend to have one meal a day. I was going to say, yeah. when do you have breakfast, when do you have yeah. lunch, when do you have... But now you say you have one meal a day. Most of the time. And so, you're able to survive on one meal a day. Yeah. Wow. It, I mean, it, it works out quite a reasonable size So meal. what time would you have that meal? Yeah, that would be around about 6, 7 o'clock. PM? PM, yeah. And, and is it heavy or is it... It's not, it's not that heavy because my, my meals, are, they're all plant-based. So it's fruit, vegetables, whole grain, rice, beans, all that stuff. 
fruit salad and you have all these greens around six seven yeah 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 and what time do you go to bed well i like to get into bed by 10 11. then you wake up around five yeah and i wake up oh. around five yeah that's that, that's my general routine um keeps me going but that that exercise bit mm -hmm. is vital for mm -hmm. me and the exercise is around what time is so that starts from about nine o'clock. Nine a.m. Yeah, okay. yeah, nine o'clock. So I've done some work before that that gets me going. And then whilst I'm exercising, whatever I've been writing, it's going over in my head and I can mm. then resolve things in the afternoon if I have time to. Yeah. I know you do a lot of um, public speaking. Mm. That's, that's a joy and a pleasure. I, I do it with, with a friend of mine also. We, we put on events, health mm -hmm. events, not just speaking events, because we try to make health entertaining mm. it's a difficult thing to get people just to come to a health lecture mm -hmm. we try to make it entertaining it could be with music it could be with acting but to make the point about what we're talking about so um, yeah but I, I come and I just do simple talks as well thank you thank you once again thank you very much for your time and thank you for allowing us in your home my pleasure. And we, we look forward to the is it live colors life coming colors. out? Yes. And then we're going to promote it from um, our viewers and listeners to also join on board. Excellent. So thank you once again, Doc. You're welcome. Thank you.